I'm like, if you thought, you know, giving, you know, certain, certain species very specific abilities was kind of racist before, and now you have orcs, or you speak orc if you happen to be a gladiator. Like that, I'm like, I think you're going in the wrong direction. Like you didn't get the inside of it. I'm Nerdarchist Ted. And I'm Nerdarchist Dave. Welcome, Welcome to, to Nerdarchy. Nerdarchy. For nerds, by, by nerds. All right, so what's today's video about today? Well, for a while, I've been thinking about, um, you know, D&D backgrounds and the way Wizards of the Coast is removing cultures from the game and D&D races. And then one D&D came out and we kind of saw, like, which direction they're going into mm -hmm. with it. So I thought maybe this would be a good point for us to talk about you know, one D and D backgrounds, races, and culture in the game. So I guess we'll start off with why why is monolithic cultures bad? Well, for for one, it doesn't make any sense, right? Like if you're a dwarf, no matter what part of the world you're from, or time period, really, they're all the same, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe their sub race will differentiate you somewhat. But, but really, that's it, you know? The same thing with elves, halflings, humans. It's, it's all monolithic, right? And it doesn't make any sense. Uh, it's one of the things that people really have a problem with, with, you know, the D&D races. You know, why would they all be the same? If you're a elf that, you know, lives in the tundra or the Arctic, uh, why would you be exactly the same as the elf that lives in the desert? Uh, it's, it's like, okay, you know... You know, is genetics like, okay, you're a this. No matter where you go, you're still a this. Does cer certainly seem weird to me. Yeah, well, yeah, and some of it is so far beyond genetics, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, and and then in addition to that, and I think, I think this is the thing that people really seem to take issue with, is there's a lot of cultural stuff that are ingrained into the different D&D races. And, you know, Wizards of the Coast seems to be responding to that in a way where they just want to rip all the culture out of everything. And also, and some and some other things as well. But it also becomes kind of weird the way they do it. And also, I'm not overly impressed about how they've done it so far. A lot of it just feels really lazy to me. And they're just like, oh, because of the gods, or because of Fae. the Fey <laughs> Wild, or magic, or anything but coming up with a cool story. There's nothing like magically having the ability to know how to use guns. Yeah, yeah, that is a great example. Uh, so, I. I feel cultures are one of those things that make uh, race or whatnot unique. So seeing that kind of stuff being like stripped and pulled away, it, it kind of hurts to the core because like there's so much lore in D and D that is attached to that culture. Yeah, and we're going to also get into some ideas for solutions as well as we get a little bit deeper. So why is erasing biological traits bad? So to me, this part is really bizarre. And I, I just feel like the people that have a problem with these biological uh, differences or uh, bioessentialism, I think is what they call it, is like every, I almost feel like they think every race is a human with different skin color or something. I, I, do, I just don't get it because, you know, an orc is just not a different type of human. A halfling is not a short human. You know, they're distinctive species that I don't think, I think maybe the, the, the term race is where things get kind of, kind of muddled a little bit and where they're more like species. I think it, you know, it's more like comparing a chihuahua to an elephant, right? Like you wouldn't expect the same things from them. So biologically, they're a lot different. They're gonna have different traits. And this is something that might actually be the same, even if you're an, you know, an elf that grew up in different places, just because biologically, mm. you know, those things are ingrained in your DNA, that, that would kind of make sense. Um, as you know, as well, and then you could also have some like variations as well. You know, there's there's a number of cultures that step beyond the the biology. You know, but biology is is the, in my opinion, the the part that's going to be the same regardless. But culture is what gives us our differences. Yeah. Well. Yeah. So that is nature versus nurture kind of kind of deal, and and also it's weird because in some instances you'll see like. Wizards of the Coast is leaving in biological things, but stripping them in other places. Mm -hmm. So it's like they don't even seem to 
truly <laughs> grasp what they want to do at times. They're not they're not following their same pattern. Yeah, for sure. So I guess like what is some things we can do to fix this? Like what one of the easiest things is you could leave everything kind of the way it is and be like, well, you know, these are examples of specific fantasy race tropes that you could use in your game, but you know, you can always change them and customize them and tailor them to your own games if you wanted to, because it would really be hard to kind of have like a dwarf, elf, halfling, orc for every different variety and flavor. Um, you know, some of the, you know, along the terms, along the lines of the biological stuff, um, you know, people have a, a, take issue with the stat adjustments a lot of times. Um, now, the one I do agree with them with people on is the fact that some races have negatives, but most of them don't like get like I think that should be either they all have pluses and minuses, or none of them do right. right? They all just have pluses. So when Volo's uh, Guide to Monsters came out, I thought that was very dumb because it didn't follow Wizards' own, own precedent that had, they had already set. Right. Now I've I've had people come around, you know, being like, well, I guess physically, some you know some uh, traits could you know would make sense, right? Because I'm like, why would why would a halfling and a minotaur be the same strength? Like it doesn't make any sense. One is huge, burly creature, and the other is much smaller. Um, and and so they come around on the physical stuff, but you know, if you look in nature itself, some animals use tools. Very few of them, and some, and but many don't, right? right? Clearly, some have greater cognitive abilities than others, right? Now, yes, this will be a problem if we're saying everything is human, you know, but that's not what we're saying. They're just different. They have different values, and, and you know, also, this could also be a cultural thing as well. But I've always looked at it like, well, you're like, well, I grew, I'm an orc, but I grew up as a mage. Well, I would have bonuses to my strength. I'm like... Well, you could put your 15 in your intelligence and your 8 in your strength and you're still a weak orc. You're just stronger than maybe, you know, uh, someone from another species or race right. already. And, you know, in 5e D&D, &D, you max out of 20 anyway. So a lot, you know, so really it doesn't matter. You're going to be as smart as the smartest human. Eventually, it might just take a little bit longer. Right. You know, if you know, if you're a race that doesn't get an inherent bonus to your intelligence stat, so that's another thing that makes it a little bit weird. You know, but there's there's so many people that have feel it's necessary, and there's plenty of YouTube channels and and things where the the build and the the minutia of where your points are and where they go that it's breeding a, a culture of well, you need to. You need to be prime stat, and you need yeah. to build the character to be a, as ideal as possible because combat is such a large portion of the game. And, well, if you are missing 5% of the time because you didn't put, you know, your prime stat into, you know, your... Or you didn't put your, your best abilities in that prime stat, you know, that you're going to suffer throughout the game because of it. Yeah. Well, until you hit a certain level and then everything evens out again, you get it back. Well, so so there's a couple things that we can look at and do, right? One is if you look at Pathfinder 2E, they actually have a pretty good system where, you know, it's your race, it's your class, it's your, um, you have a background and, well, their race, they call them ancestry. So you have an ancestry, you have a class, a background, and I feel like there's something else they get as well. And they all affect your stats, right? That would be one way of doing it. Like, you know, D and D one D and D has moved into it's all based off of background now, which is is also very weird anyway. Um because you know, because but and also it gives you a language, right? And I'm like, if you thought, you know, giving, you know, certain certain species very specific abilities was kind of racist before, and now you have orcs. Or you speak orc if you happen to be a gladiator. Like that, I'm like, I think you're going in the wrong direction. Like you didn't get the inside of it. That, that is not fixing the problem. And it is very bizarre. Right. So I, I think, you know, you're, you're looking at the right, right components here. So if you've got a race, a lineage, an ancestry, you can choose whatever terminology you want. A culture, a background, and then a class. If all of those informed your stats in some way, shape, or form, I think that could that could go a long way towards fixing the issues 
And you know, even if you're worried about like, oh, well, what is that going to do to the standards array? Does that in does that increase the, uh, the the power level? No, you could just lower what numbers you get in the stat array, um, you know, possibly off of the higher end, so that you could still build to the same numbers that we have now but you do so in a way that makes sense and you know you're happy with yeah maybe if you start with essentially a plus four right and you can't get more than a plus two into any one stat each one gives you a plus one um you know if we look at background race class and actually we haven't talked about this yet but culture right so the idea is taking a culture template and having groups of them that can be overlaid on top of any race any character um and it's just like oh did you come from a militant society a theocracy a ma majocracy a technocracy something that's seafaring i know so, you know so, something that's you know you're more nomadic there's there's so many different ways so many different cultures that you could apply and whether you get a language, a skill, and a stat associated with it, I think that would make sense. And I think, it, you know, with any of those, you could very much have, well, I'm a thing, you get a choice of one skill, a yeah. choice of a couple different languages, as well as a choice of like two different stats. This way you could still build something interesting and have it like, well, I get a choice between, you know, maybe one prime and one not, you know, kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, you have two characters playing dwarves, right? Um, one takes the majocracy uh, culture, and the other, you know, the other takes uh, a militant, right? But the one that takes a militant takes a sage background, because even though they grew up in a militant society, what they really care about is lore and history and all that stuff. And the one that grew up in the majocracy actually, you know, they took the soldier background because they, you know, they are more into war and you know maybe they're more physical and more combative in nature. Uh, so and, and and it's just the job they went into. Like they, you know, you still need to have a watch or mm -hmm. a standing army, right? Oh, yeah. So so it, then, like, we can have two different dwarves from different societies that now they're very different because of their upbringing, and then also the the life choices they made background, right? You know, their profession that they initially chose, and then their character class, right? So these could make for very different characters, and you've kind of just built out two different dwarf societies with very little work. Yeah, you know, and and by doing that, that actually helps shape the world and and informs the DM of like, well, all right, well, clearly there's two distinctive dwarf clans in my world. If you know this one is is far more militant uh, and martial, whereas this one is a majocracy. Well, I mean to. To old hats like Dave and I, dwarves used to not be allowed to be mages or wizards. Uh, so to have a dwarven mageocracy in a world, like, well, what does that mean? Like, when did when did in this world, this culture, when did dwarves acquire enough magic to become a power and a, and thus a mageocracy? Or in your world, maybe completely, it's completely the opposite. When did these other dwarves devolve into this militant mm. warlike? Uh, culture, right? So, <laughs> Two sides of the same coin. Right. So, so you can play with it in different ways. I think that would be a much better and more elegant solution. And here's the other problem. Like the GIF is the perfect example of this. Because of their god and magic, they are now like really good with guns and they're marksmen and they get really great abilities and they can even do extra damage. But it's not cultural. But it's, it's not magic. cultural. But here's the thing. If you make it an in innate ability that they all have would that not become their culture in the long run right like after generations of that and would and would there be a difference from the non-gif uh perspective someone that's outside their culture looking in they'd be like no these guys are just all gun fanatics i think wizards is heading in a good direction but personally i hate wishy-washy mechanics don't actually mean anything um they started doing that with the stats where it's like here's where the you know it was like here's where they are for the races now let's put them wherever so it doesn't matter i don't know why that bothers me just because i've been playing the game a long time maybe and then the backgrounds are like you know, here's what you you would use to build a background, but then there's they then they're like, well, here are some backgrounds. Now, if they're like every person just builds their own background and you know gets to name it, decides what, what's part of it, that is actually better to me than than you know the sample ones that they showed us. Now, if they want to do samples just to kind of like give an example, that's fine. But I'm I don't like the idea of like here pick one of these or do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. 
So all of this is in playtest, so people are able to you know weigh in on it and share your opinions with them. So we don't know exactly what the final D and D one is going to look like when we get this you know major update in you know a little over a year or so. Um, I'm intrigued to see what direction they go. I hope that enough people kind of view view it the same way we do, like this, and uh, mayhaps we can see that kind of change and. Be, be far more informative and give the options that we really looking for. But hey, you like these videos, others like it, as well as all the awesome content over at nerdarchy.com, why not come check us out on Patreon and support us over there. Articles like expand your role playing through culture and heritage in 5e d, &D. Or another way to support us is to head over to nerdarchy.com and check out some of our products. We have one that's free called Spirit of the Forge. In Spirit of the Forge, characters discover the Mage Forge, the most powerful magic item creation forge in the multiverse. If adventurers puzzle out how to gain entry, they'll have to deal with the artifact stewards and prove themselves worthy of the Mage Forge's incredible potential. This special encounter was created as a free promotion for Mage Forge, magic items for 5th edition, designed in the same style as the 55 gorgeously illustrated out-of-the-box encounters, Spirit of the Forge is ready to drop right into your games. With a new monster, a powerful sentient artifact, and the means to make, unmake, and forge your own magic items along with engaging story elements, this easy-to-use scenario will energize your game session. So let us know what you think. How do you think Wizards of the Coast should do it? Are you happy with the one d and playtest and what they're doing with backgrounds? Would you like to see something else? Maybe you'd like to see, see them do more, something more like Paizo did with, you know, a little bit more diversifying where your bonuses come from, or do you like the put it wherever you want, Method. Let us know down in the comments below. While you're down there, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, even go ahead and click on that notification bell. You know the drill. Quick reminder, we drop new videos here on the channel Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, so come on back, but you can't wait till then. We've got you covered. There's a card up here for a, pl a playlist. Three new ways to do D&D races. So until next time, stay, stay nerdy. nerdy.